Welcome to the Liberty Baptist Sermon Archives. The message you're about to hear was preached at Liberty Baptist Church in Easton, Massachusetts. You can find out more about us or contact us at mylibertybaptist.org or just look us up on Facebook. And now we hope that this message from God's Word will be a blessing to you. Open your Bibles, please, to Revelation chapter number 8 this evening. We are in Revelation once again in chapter number 8. And the title of the message this evening is The Disaster of Choosing the Wrong God. The Disaster of Choosing the Wrong God. We're going to talk about several natural disasters tonight that come from the hand of God. But the greatest disaster that anyone can have befall upon their life is choosing the wrong God. There's a lot of choices out there to choose from, aren't there? Of course, there really is no choice, is there? There is just God himself. But there are many false gods who are out there, and there is no greater disaster. There is no greater calamity that can take place, even from what we see here in Revelation chapter number 8 tonight, than someone choosing the wrong God. Because calamities and difficulties in this life last for this life and this life alone. But choosing the wrong God is a choice that has eternal ramifications, that it lasts for eternity, that someone would either spend eternity in heaven or an eternity in the lake of fire in hell. And so looking at Revelation chapter number eight tonight, you'll remember that last week we saw from the first six verses that there were prayers that were received before the Lord. And we saw that prayer moves the hands that move the world. We looked at that last week, that prayer literally comes before God and changes the course of history. Not the fact that God is unaware of what is going on in history, but that He hears the prayers of His saints, that He takes time to listen to what you and I pray, which is something that should bring great encouragement to us tonight. But yet we saw last week as we ended in verse number six, that there were the angels who were there with their hands on the trumpets. They were ready to have those trumpet judgments begin. They were ready for just the word to be given so that they would be unfolding and unleashing upon the earth. And we're going to look at that here tonight. And what's interesting about what we're going to see is that these trumpet judgments, the first four we will see tonight, by God's grace, we'll start to look at the next three, which are even worse than the first four next week uh, in Revelation chapter number nine. But what we'll see from these four that we look at this evening is they will mimic the plagues that took place in Egypt. Now they won't uh, plague for plague necessarily, but we're going to see a lot of connections. So there's actually a couple things that I want to point out before we even read our text tonight. A couple things that I want to bring to light to you before we read so that when we're reading our text that you'll notice them tonight. The first is that you're going to see the number of one third quite a bit in the text. That number one third will play a prominent role in this chapter as well as in chapter number nine. And you say, well, pastor, what is the significance of one third? And we could maybe try to look at a few different things of what they could be. And I did some research and saw that there were a few different conflicting ideas of what one third could be. But I do know this as a fact. I know this for certain that when we were just a few chapters ago, we saw that the judgments were affecting one quarter of the creation. Do you remember that? Even in Revelation chapter number six, when we saw those seals being opened, that there was one quarter of different parts of the earth that were being affected. Now, I'm not a mathematician. We talked about math a few weeks ago, and I don't like math, and I'm not great at math. But I do know this, one-third is more than one-quarter. So what does that tell us? That we're seeing a worsening of the judgments, and we're seeing the scope of the judgments grow even larger than what we saw when the seals were being opened a couple of chapters ago. But I also notice in our text that the creation is going to be affected in a way that really nothing is spared. It, we'll see in our text that the ground is going to be uh, judged, if you will, that the oceans will have judgment laid upon them, freshwater bodies will have the same, and even celestial bodies will all have some form of effect laid upon them by God as judgment upon the people of this earth. And just in the same way that the 10 plagues, you remember those plagues, each of them, they were not just plagues at random. God was not up in heaven rolling dice with plagues on them, trying to figure out, well, what should we do first? Oh, blood and water. Uh, what should we do? Remember, God very systematically was going through each plague as a way to show the Egyptians how inept their gods were that the gods of the waters, that the gods uh, of the harvest, that the God of the sun was not able to protect 
the people of Egypt. So by the time the 10th plague was done, by the time the people were weeping and wailing because the firstborn were dead, their land literally barren and desolate before them, they are shoving goods into the hands of the Jews. And they're saying this, take everything we've got, just get out of here, get out of here right now. We don't want you around here anymore. The Bible says they literally spoiled the Egyptians, not through warfare, but because of what God did, they were basically giving them bounty and saying this, if you just get out of here now, will you take everything we got? Because we don't want you and we don't want your God around anymore. But as they're walking away, as they're, they're, they're silently leaving on that Passover day, uh, I have to imagine in my mind this land that's scarred, this land that's pretty much destroyed by the plagues and the cries of the people that are being heard by all of this and all parts of creation even then around Egypt in that very localized set of plagues was affected by what happened during those 10 plagues. But what we're about to see is not only all-encompassing in the sense that it covers all of nature itself, but it's all-encompassing in the sense that it's not just Egypt, it's the entire planet. So we're seeing a ratcheting up of the amount of judgment from one quarter to one third. We're seeing a ratcheting up of not just localized judgment, but something that is happening on a global scale. And we're going to see that God has a purpose and a plan to this, just like with the, just like with the plagues, not that God has this desire to create chaos for the sake of chaos, but God has a plan. And by the way, God has mercy even within his plan. If you're not sure about that, well, he left two-thirds of those things behind. He left two-thirds of people behind. He left a remnant there. So there were still people who had the opportunity to call upon Jesus Christ, their Savior. But I want us to look here tonight at Revelation chapter 8. We're going to start back again at verse number 1 to kind of give us a running start from where we were last week. But we're really going to focus on verse number 7 to the end of the chapter where it says this, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints unto the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which was come, uh, which came rather, uh, with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. That's where we ended last week. The first angel sounded and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And there were cast upon the earth and the third part of the trees was burnt up and all green grass was burnt up. And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them were darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And I beheld, and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. And we'll see by the end of verse number 13, and it's also mentioned in chapter number nine as well, that although these four trumpets are very bad, that the three that are to follow are called the woe trumpets. The woe pronounced for each one of them, woe. Whoa, whoa, and then again reiterated in chapter number nine as well that the best is not yet to come, but could we put it this way? The worst is yet to come in the judgment of God upon the people. Well, in verse six last week, we saw that the angels were ready to sound the trumpets. Now we've just read their full force and their full effect. 
And so I want us to look at each one of them here tonight and then to draw some conclusions that maybe will be a help to us tonight as well. So as we look at these, first of all, this outline is going to be really, it's going to be out there tonight. Are you ready? Number one is this, the first trumpet, all right? Sometimes you can be too clever, you know? Number one is the first trumpet. That's what it is. That's what the number is on the outline. Verse number seven gives us the account of this first trumpet with the first angel sounding. And that first trumpet harkens back to the seventh plague, which is found in Exodus chapter number nine, the hail and the fire mingled with blood. And by the way, this is spoken of in the Old Testament. Much of what we see here, by the way, it's not coming to us at random, but it actually harkens back to Old Testament passages. Some of them we'll make mention of, like Joel chapter 2, verse 30, where it says, And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. You say, but pastor, hail and fire together mingled with blood. Uh, what will that be like? And the answer to that I have to you is, I don't know. I don't know why blood is mingled with that. I don't know how that will be. It could be the blood of birds that are in the air. It could be blood of anything else. It could be really whatever God desires and deems it to be. Uh, we just look at this tonight and there are certain things that we say, okay, we could see a scientific explanation for this and we might try to make some parallels to that. But we also understand that God does not have to match something that has been revealed to us scientifically now, a scientific phenomenon that we are already seeing and have to, we have to match a parallel to each and every one of these for the book of Revelation to make sense. Because God, who is the one who created it all, God is the one who put all of the scientific laws into place. And it's the same God who can also remove the laws of science at his whim when he do desires and deigns it so to be. By the way, that's literally what a miracle is. It's God removing those quote unquote laws of science because God is not bound by the laws of science. He put them in place. And he is the one that can remove them when he sees fit to be able to accomplish that which he wants to accomplish. And so, yes, we have fire and we have hail and we have blood. Do we know exactly how that will be? No, we don't. I don't, at least. And uh, anyone who tells you they know for certain, I think, uh, probably is over their skis a little bit to be able to say so. But I will say this. I do know this. It's going to happen because the Bible said so. That's that much is good enough for me, and maybe that makes me a simpleton, Make me that makes me simplistic. I just happen to get to the point where I say, well, if God says that's what's going to happen, well, that's going to happen. We can speculate and maybe have some thoughts about what it could be, but in the end, God will accomplish it because He said so. But I do want to concentrate on for a moment, not necessarily on how we connect it with atmospheric phenomenon that we can see today, but let's just take a moment and realize what such a plague what such a trumpet judgment placed upon the earth, what it would do to the earth, what it would do to the inhabitants, what it would do to the economy of the earth. Uh, it says again in verse number seven that the, they were cast upon the earth and the third part of the trees were burnt up and all green grass was burnt up. Do you realize the downstream ramifications of having a third of the trees being burnt, as well as all green grass with life in it to be able to be burnt up. Well, let's start here, that the word for trees in the Greek here in verse number seven typically talks of fruit bearing trees. So we're not just talking about your elms or your oaks, but we're talking about trees that actually yield fruit that people would eat and that's good for not only for people, but also for animal life as well. A third of that is just taken off the market. You realize what happened to commodities when just a few eggs were not available uh, not that long ago because of, well, whatever was going on, whatever we were told and whatever actually happened, who knows? But uh, I do know this, that there were some eggs that were gone and all of a sudden you and I were getting second mortgages so, so that we could buy a dozen eggs. You want an omelet? What's like, what, are you rich? You want an omelet? Like, get out of here. We don't got that kind of money. Uh, why? Because uh, all that was happening during that time. Uh, but now could you imagine that a third of those commodities are off the table? They're completely gone. You want to talk about supply chain, get out of here. By the way, keep reading, the supply chain's about to get decimated. But uh, we're talking about fruit-bearing trees, just those alone, a third of them gone. But the economy now uh, is in even more upheaval than I would suspect it already is up to this point. Remember we talked about that you had all of these prices for the wheat, and but don't touch the oil, don't touch the wine. We already saw that the economy was changing where people were having difficulty having to pay a day's wage just to be able to get the basics. But the people that want the luxuries, those high ups, they had a way to be able to get what they wanted. That 1% was certainly able to take care of themselves, no doubt through what they took care of. But 
now we see this is going to touch every part in every direction of the economy. The food supply is an upheaval. The fruit of the ground is going to be limited. Fruits, vegetables, grains, you talk about green grasses. Where is all this coming from? A lot of this or all of it is being burnt up. Pasture land is now limited. What happened? Well, what's going to happen to the cows that need to graze and others uh, that use that as animals to be able to uh, get their food? And so what's going to happen? Dairy is going to be a problem. Beef is going to be a problem. So even meats, all of these things are going to be very difficult resources to be able to get, not even counting what's going to happen to the earth itself because of it being literally scorched earth. I mean, that's what happens here. This isn't just something that we're making up here or a term that we're pulling from somewhere else. This is literally God scorching the earth and there being great consequences all happening just from this first trumpet in verse number seven. But further, number two, are you ready for this? The second trumpet. Didn't see that one coming, did you? All right. So, yeah, this, yeah some of you are, are, are showing me your surprise right now. All right, good. The second trumpet. This is in verses number 8 and 9. It says, And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. You think of water being turned to blood, and well, our mind immediately goes to the first plague. When we go all the way back to Egypt and we realize that there were those who were able to, not just Moses, but others who were able to turn water into blood, but the problem was they couldn't turn it back. And so they realized that they didn't have as much power as they thought that they had. But God's judgment in verse number 8 and 9, God's judgment in this second trumpet is threefold. There's judgment upon the seas, judgment upon the creatures of the seas, and then judgment upon the ships of the seas. All three of those have lost one-third of their components. Both in Zephaniah 1.3 and Hosea 4.3, it mentions the fish of the sea dying as judgment from God during the end times. Now, there are some who would say, and I did some studying today and looked at some different uh, commentators and different voices that would weigh in on this that would say, and when the Bible talks of the sea here, it's talking of the Great Sea. It's talking about the Mediterranean Sea. And I would argue with someone that had that opinion, uh, no doubt, but it would seem to me that that would be an odd interpretation here when everything else is happening on a worldwide scale and all of a sudden we're limiting what's happening here just to the Mediterranean Sea. I understand that many of the nations around the Mediterranean the Sea in this time are going to be what we call the hot spot of the globe, no doubt, during this time. Uh, but at the same time, I, I see no reason to look at this any other way than what it is that a third of the sea, the third of the creatures, and the third of the ships uh, will all be harmed, will all be destroyed in their own ways uh, during this time. But it happens because there's this great mountain that's burning with fire. And you say, well, pastor, what is this great mountain that burns with fire? And I would tell you this, once again, are you ready? I'm not exactly sure. Uh, you're going to hear me say that a lot about certain things, but I'd rather tell you uh, that instead of trying to pretend like I don't know. But I will say there is an interesting phrase here because we're every word Bible readers. We don't just read some words. We want to take into effect every word that's there. There's a phrase that's here that's unique that we haven't seen as much in the book of Revelation, but we do need to take in here for a moment. Look at what it says in verse 8. And the second angel sounded and as it were a great mountain burning with fire. It does not say it was a great mountain burning with fire. It says, as it were. So what does this mean? This means this is something that would very likely have the look of a great mountain burning with fire, but is not necessarily a great mountain burning with fire. I think of a great mountain burning with fire, and I think of a volcano. That's the first thing that I think of. But it would seem to me that this is something that's being cast down. And I, looking in the Greek, it would mean what we would mean today, just kind of the cast out, to cast down, to be able to throw something down. So it's not something that's erupting necessarily from the sea. It seems like it's something that has the look of something that is fiery. Now, what could we look at that? Could it be a fiery meteor? Uh, that landed in the ocean. Imagine the impact, the deep impact. Imagine the great heat from coming through the atmosphere. Uh, could you imagine literally boiling the waters? Could you imagine maybe whatever type of poisonous uh, effects were inside that, taking that, uh, in, uh, imparting that to the water, then maybe that spreading through the, uh, the, the currents and such? Uh, could something like that happen? Absolutely. Uh, here's what I know. Once again, we don't know exactly how it will happen, 
but we know what happens and we know the effects. And the effects is this, as much as the ground was harmed in the first trumpet judgment, the sea, the, the, the ocean, not fresh water, we're gonna get to that in a second, but the ocean itself is going to be harmed in a way that we can't even imagine or understand today. Again, think of the devastation. Could you imagine maybe after that first trumpet judgment and the food chain is just absolutely obliterated, what could man turn to during that time? Perhaps seafood? Perhaps looking to the earth? Uh, looking to the ocean, rather, to be able to harvest as much food as possible? And then what happens? Guess what? That rug is pulled out. B by the way, it, it, I'm going to put this very unartfully, but I think it's probably not a good thing for a pastor to say. I'll put this very unartfully, but understand what I'm about to say and the heart in which it's said. But if God wants to get you, he'll get you. Well, the, the, well, you know, we, we, well, he, he may have done something to the ocean. And by the way, I think we've looked at this before. I think they're very aware, the people on the earth, who's doing this at this point. Well, you know, we'll get our food from the ocean. Oh, yeah? Now what are you going to do? You know, when it comes to the Lord and when it comes to his judgment, listen, hey, Jonah, you can get on the ship and go the exact opposite direction, but if God's going to get you, He's going to get you. Wouldn't it just be better if we're just up front, right with God in all of our accounts and everything that we do instead of trying to run from him, instead of trying to get that ticket to Tarshish, instead of trying to say, oh, Lord, you want to pull the rug out here? Uh, realizing that if he does that, he's doing it out of benevolence and kindness and love, trying to draw us back to him. Say, oh, yeah, Lord, you think you can uh, close that door? Well, I'll pry open a window over here. Guess what? The God who closed the door is the one that's going to take the window and slam it on your hands uh, when you're trying to jump out because he loves you. Because he's trying to draw you to him. No, no. Not, again, not because he's the God of chaos who, who's up there in, in, in heaven just rubbing his hands together and saying, oh, this is great. This is like the, a big video game. I get to do this over here and this over here and just watch it all burn. No, no. He has a purpose behind every single hailstone. He has a purpose behind the great mountain that's fiery. He has a purpose behind that which is called wormwood, that star we're about to see that comes from heaven. He has a purpose for all of that. And it's not to cause chaos. It's actually to bring people in harmony with him. That's his desire. Think about this even further. The economy is not stabilized because now the fish of the sea, or a third of them are gone. But I, I did some research on this today. According to the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, as of 2022, there are over 100,000 vessels globally. Not, not little boats, but we're talking about global vessels, seafaring vessels, ships. That includes bulk carriers, tankers, container ships, and other types of cargo and passenger vessels. Now, bulk containers are for commodities like grain and rice. Tankers are for chemical products like oil and gas. Container ships are generally for many, many ready-made <laughs> products. You know, the kind of things they ship in a container that you buy on Amazon or something that's already, already done. It's already completed. Weren't you in the Navy? Anyway, um, but uh, 100,000. Sorry, I, I did. We've got to edit that out. But 100,000 ships today. Now imagine what happens when a third of them, 33,000 of them, are gone. Gas, oil, precious metals, maybe wheat that had been stored that they were trying to move from one place to another because so much of it had been decimated. Goods, all of it, not all of it, a third of it, so much of it is gone. Can you see how this is going to affect people? Can you see the lines for toilet paper growing that much larger? Could you see that just being a shadow? Oh, you see that being the head of a pin compared to what we see here already with just the first and second trumpets being blown. Now 33,000 ships are gone. That's today, by the way. That number, what I read, changed dramatically just in the last 40 years. 40 years ago, you're talking about maybe 30,000, now 100,000. What if the Lord tarries even longer? Could you see what the effects will be? We can't even calculate. So we see the first trumpet. We see the second trumpet. Get ready. The third trumpet. I like that feeling of mystery. That's good. So the third trumpet. Verses 10 and 11. 
And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell from the third part of the fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the stars called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Now, with this trumpet, there is no doubt there's a celestial body that makes a worldwide impact. Where perhaps in the previous trumpet judgment, we could have different thoughts about what it could be, although certainly it does seem like there would be some similarities. Here it seems that there is really no room for us to make another interpretation, that it's something that fell from heaven. And once again, this is not an allegory for, well, you know, there was someone who once was a great person who happened to be on high and they fell and it was a political leader that, no, no, we're talking about literal events that are happening future to now. And we see this literal uh, great star from heaven. So is it an asteroid that breaks apart? Is it something that as it enters, because it breaks apart, it's going to enter into the bodies of water, not just necessarily into the ocean, but into rivers and into lakes, and it's going to cause difficulties there? I don't know. It could just be, as we mentioned before, divinely inspired judgment. So once again, we have to remind ourselves it doesn't need to conform to our current anomalies. We don't have to find something that exactly is going to fall uh, from the sky that's going to go into the water and make a third of the water undrinkable and cause damage and death. We don't have to find the exact parallel. But I will say that we do find some of the elements here already in history and already even in botany. Wormwood. Uh, wormwood, it, is it, it's an actual plant that is around even today. Uh, it says the star was called wormwood. You say, what a strange thing for a star to be called wormwood. Do you realize the Psalms tells us God names all the stars? By the way, what human being could do that? It'd be impossible. It says God names the stars, Psalm 147, verse 4. He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. That's what it says of the Lord. Wormwood in the Bible is always a representation of, of bitterness, and it is still a bitter herb today. By the way, consuming enough wormwood can cause death in the person that consumes it. And so it's a very bitter herb, and it doesn't take a lot of it for someone to get very sick or to die. Deuteronomy 29, 18 talks of wormwood as well when it says, lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations, lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. See, God says this, when you take a relationship with me, and you turn it into something else, what it is, it's like taking on gall. Remember what they made Jesus drink, that very bitter drink? Gall and wormwood, you're taking it in. When you have a relationship with God and you turn away from it, it, it it's galling, it, it, it's very bitter. And that's what's mentioned. In fact, it reminds me of, this is not a plague, but right after the 10 plagues and the Israelites leave, you'll remember they get to the place that's called Mara in Exodus chapter 15. There was a place where there was bitter water that was there. And what did God do? He made the bitter water sweet. But what did he do for the people of God that were following him? He made bitter water sweet. What is he doing for people that are rejecting him? He's making sweet water bitter. You see the irony of what God is doing here? Do you see what God is trying to teach and what tr God is trying to communicate to these people if they would only listen to him? According to National Geographic, there are 100 principal rivers in the world, with the longest being the Amazon at over 4,000 miles. The Mississippi here in the United States is 3,700 miles long. Uh, the thought of water turning bitter is not an unusual one. According to commentator Layman Strauss, on March 21st, 1923, a volcanic explosion in the Aleutian Islands caused the water to become so bitter that it was unfit for use. So you can see we can kind of make some connections already from just loose threads that we have already of things that we've experienced, but no doubt uh, this is what will happen in the future. And it says that, that many men died of the waters because they were made bitter, not necessarily giving us the one-third number, but many seems to indicate, well, it's not a few. There's going to be many that are going to die. But I would say even more than that, if many will die because of fresh water systems becoming corrupted, 
I mean, that's what's going to happen. We rely on fresh water today to be able to sustain us. Fresh water systems now becoming corrupted, polluted. Uh, they're being filtered in uh, flowing water into water systems that is now bitter. It's, it's wormwood, if you will. Uh, it, it's not fit to drink, but people have to drink something. They're doing whatever they can. They're desperate for water. They're desperate for whatever they can. Just like someone who is on the ocean is so desperate. They're drinking seawater, knowing it's going to kill them, but they just can't do anything else. There will be some that will just say, I know this water is not going to be good for me, but I'm just going to take a chance and many will die because of that. But even during uh, this time, if this is happening to man, what's going to happen to the fish that are in those lakes and streams and ponds that are not just drinking it, but they're immersed in it? Could I tell you that what's happened even before in the second trumpet with seafood and sea life is going to only continue with the freshwater life as well? What's going to happen to the vegetation? that's directly drawing water from these areas, which many of them do. How many more are gonna die? And so you see that there is just this total ravaging that is taking place all over the earth. And wherever they turn to try to find refuge, God kicks that leg of the stool under as well and says, nope, you can't have that one either. Wherever they turn to think they can find some way to find respite, the fool's errand of all of it is, instead of turning to creation, and we'll look at this in a second, they should have turned to him. Instead of turning to that next corner of creation where they thought they could find harbor, all they had to do was turn to the creator God and they would have found rest for their souls. But instead, they just continue this fool's errand and this fool's paradise over and over and over again. And I'll say this, we'll look at this in a moment. It's not much different from what we see today. Mankind is doing the same thing today, trying to run away from God, to stay away from God, to not be accountable from God. And it's just as foolish today as it will be during the end times. So we see these first three trumpets and the fourth trumpet, well, is number four, the fourth trumpet, which is number four, the fourth trumpet. Number four. Did I mention that? Yeah, number four. Thank you, Vince. We'll edit that out as well. All right, number 12. So, no, <laughs> no we'll leave that in. I like that, yeah. Yeah, I like that. We'll leave it in. All right, verse 12. Uh, and the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Literally, the day-night cycle is going to change. There is no scientific answer for this, other than this is directly judgment from the hand of the Creator, specifically for this occasion. As I mentioned before, it's God who set the laws of science, who is allowed to suspend them. Well, God can't do that to the sun and the moon. Why not? He's the one that put them in place anyway. Well, what will happen to the world? Well, he's the one that hung the world. That's what the Bible says. And so if, if God is the one that holds uh, the sun, the moon, the earth, if he holds all of these things, then no doubt he is the one uh, that can do what he wishes and what he pleases to them, including even changing the day-night light cycle. It could be that this plague, and again, this parallels the ninth plague. Do you remember that during the ninth plague, there was the darkness all over Egypt? The Bible says you couldn't even see in front of your hand, but the people that lived in Goshen, the Jews, were able to be in brilliant light. But just as strange as it would be to be able to walk in inky black darkness and literally take a step and go into light, and that's what I believe happened, that there wasn't this gradient of light and darkness, this shadow, that literally you were in darkness and then you were in light. You say, scientifically, that doesn't make sense. Did we just cover this? It doesn't have to be what we, not, what we would think is scientifically possible, that God, who is the one that governs how light travels, is the one that can take care of issues like this. This could be during the whole tribulation. I could hear an argument that maybe this is temporary, and I believe it could be temporary only for a shortened period of time because in Revelation 16, verses 8 and 9, there will be a, a vile judgment where the sun becomes more intense. It becomes, in fact, so intense, it causes issues and difficulties for the people that are on the earth. So I don't know exactly the length of time, how this will work. Again, I just have to give you what we see here in the Word of God and take it for what it is. Everything else is just speculation. Everything else is just uh, what we might think would happen. You'll remember I mentioned earlier Joel chapter 2, verse 30, which talked about the fish of the sea that died. The next verse, Joel 2.31 says, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood 
before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And even in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus himself talks about the times and the seasons that would be changed during those final days. So this should not be a surprise to us to find this here with the fourth trumpet judgment. But I would ask you this, if the day-night cycle was to change as it is told that it will here in verse number 12, what happens to global temperatures? Should we talk for a moment about uh, uh, global warming, climate change? You want to talk about climate change? There's biblical climate change right there in verse number 12, that that light cycle is going to change. Uh, what will happen to the tides? What will happen to the seasons? What happens to the animals who rely on the rhythms of day and night? Uh, maybe you've even heard or, or have seen videos of animals that during an eclipse become very confused. Uh, because the sun's out, now the sun's not out, and now the sun comes back out again, and there's great confusion that takes place even in the animal kingdom from this. What's going to happen during a plague such as this? Think of the effect on mankind, who literally can become depressed from too much time exposed to the darkness. What do we hear this time of year when there's more darkness than light? You hear of, of people that deal with uh, it's called SAD, Seasonal Affective Disorder. The fact that you need some sun, you need to be out in the light a little bit. And, uh, you know, there are people that literally live in parts of this world where they have no sun for, you know, at least a couple months when they live in those Nordic areas up uh, in areas that are very uh, high north. In fact, uh, my father-in-law here would be able to tell you that just in Scotland that uh, when you get in the winter, you go to work. We think we go to work and come home and it's dark both times, even more so there because they're so close to the Arctic Circle where they are. Now imagine all of this changing just like that. But I have to think of the scoffers because there were scoffers in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 4 who addressed something very similar to this and they said this. They said, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. What are they going to say now? What do people say? Well, you know, the sun will come up tomorrow. What if it doesn't? No, I understand it's still going to come up. It's going to be different. But what you can go into an almanac and find sunrise and sunset, and this is the way it's going to be, and no one even questions it. What if you take the charts and throw them out the window? What will that do to mankind? What will that do to their psyche when all of a sudden they have something that now cannot be explained away? There is no other explanation. Well, they're still going to reject God nonetheless. As I mentioned, verse number 13, it says there was an angel flying through the midst of heaven, announcing these three other trumpets that are to come. Each one, woe, 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 woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of three angels, which are yet to sound. And again, the message is this, the worst is yet to come. You think this is difficult, there will be even more difficulty to follow. But as we tie this up this evening, I want to make a brief observation and a brief application. So we see this here. We see it for what it is. But I want to make a brief observation about this and a brief application to us before we're done. So do this. Would you turn your Bibles, please, to Romans chapter number 1. Romans chapter number 1. Would we agree today that mankind, by and large, has turned the earth into an idol? I think many people would have to agree that that's the case. The tree-hugging movement, I've never hugged a tree. Seems like it's far too uh, uh, difficult to do. Uh, doesn't seem very comfortable to do. I've never hugged one. I have no desire to. By the way, the Bible does tell us that we're to keep the earth and we're to be good stewards of the earth. But there is a difference between being a good steward of the earth and worshiping the earth. There is a big difference, isn't there? God gave us the earth to have dominion over it. He reiterated that not only to Adam and Eve, but also to Noah as well, that we are to have the dominion of the earth, we are to keep the earth, we are to use it for our best and highest uses, uh, but at the same time, we're to do so in such a responsible way that other generations will be able to have the same benefits as we do. But there is a difference between saying, you know what, I I'm, I'm not going to throw uh, this uh, yoo -hoo bottle out my car window and into the street. You know, we shouldn't do that. By the way, why are you drinking yoo -hoo? Who drinks that anymore? So who, who was that? One of you know, but uh, uh, throwing your bottle out the window and throwing it on the road, hey, don't do that. And saying this, we're going to worship Mother Earth. 
we're literally seeing people chain themselves to statues. We're seeing people take paint and we're seeing people take uh, uh, food and throwing it on priceless works of art just to show, oh yeah, well you think ruining that is bad? What happens when you ruin the earth? Making this false equivalency. And we see this all over the world today. And again, we should be good stewards of the earth, but we don't worship the earth. But what do we see with all of these trumpets, these first four trumpets, number one, number two, number three, number four, God is taking his creation, which by the way, he can do because it's his creation. It's not our creation. It's his creation. He is taking his creation and he is doing on a worldwide scale what he did back in the book of Exodus. Again, going back to the beginning of the message. Don't make me re-preach the message, but going back to the beginning of the message, it's far too late for that. And Patch Club will not be happy about that if I start from the beginning. But the idea is this. God very distinctly put the plagues together as a way to make sure that the people of Egypt were without excuse, that their gods were not gods. And the real disaster was not the fact that they had these 10 plagues take place. The real disaster was they chose the wrong God. Because those other disasters were temporary. The disaster of choosing the wrong God is eternal. So what is God doing in these first four trumpets? What he is doing is he is exposing those who have taken the earth as the highest and greatest form of idolatry. And he's showing them what the earth truly is. And he's humbling the earth to try to humble them to bring them to a place of repentance. Say, well, I don't see that. Well, Romans chapter number one talks about that. Look at what it says in verse number 20. Of course, we could preach several messages just on this passage here, but I just want to use it by way of application here tonight. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, that word Godhead is what we would call Trinity today, but Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, so that they are without excuse. So, so God created this world in such a way that even the world is a testimony of who he is. Even in its fallen state, it is a testimony of the goodness and greatness of God. Well, you know, we just evolved out of nothing. That is the most foolish thing that anyone could ever say. In a world where everything consistently gets worse and worse and worse, entropy, it's a real thing. Things get worse. I don't know any of us that would leave our possession out on the side of the road, your priceless possession, leave it on the side of the road for 100 years and expect it was only going to get better. One, uh, around here, in two days it'll be gone. But after 100 years, it's not going to get better and better. It's going to get worse and worse. And the only thought process that's out there that says things get better and better over time is evolution. Like it's going to cut contrary to the very laws of science that God put in place in the first place. But he says the very, even nature in its fallen state is a testimony to God. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. So there's a, there, there's a group of people who know who God is but refuse to acknowledge him. So instead, they worship the creation instead of the creator. Verse 24, wherefore God also gave them up uh, to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Look at that. They serve the creature more than the creator. And it talks at great length about the things that would cause people, uh, what happens when people have a reprobate mind, like talking about uh, the, the, the love, the lust uh, of men with men and women with women, which, which whether we were talking a few minutes ago about transgenderism or we're talking about homosexuality, sodomy is what the Bible calls it. That the Bible says that that is a natural outgrowth of a heart that has rejected God. And that tells us where our society is today on top of a lot of other things as well. It's not just that, but it's many other things as well. And so what happens here is that there is a, a, a nation, there is a people group, there is a time period where there are people who say, we hear who God is, but we don't want him. Instead, we're going to worship his creation and we're going to place that up as God. So what does God do here? 
Because are we talking about a Romans chapter 1 society during the tribulation period? <laughs> Forevermore we are. They know who he is. In fact, more so than any other time in history. There, there's 144,000 who are preaching. There are two great witnesses who are giving the word of God. They know who it is. They're cursing him for what he's doing. And all of this is going on. And what's happening? He says this, okay, you've rejected me and you've turned to creation. You've made that your idol. You think that's what's going to sustain you? You think that's what's going to help you? You think that's what's going to bring you through? What are you going to do when I take it all off the grid? What are you going to do when I take it all off the table? What do you have? And it was his way of showing the greatest disaster of all is that you've chosen the wrong God. It's a tough lesson to have to learn, particularly for a heart that refuses to listen to the grace and mercy of God. God's good at doing this. He, the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant. They placed it in front of Dagon. And what happened? Dagon the next day fell before the Ark of the Covenant. They said, well, that's kind of a strange thing. They propped the Dagon back up uh, because, you know, an idol can't probably lift itself up. We got to help our, there's a whole message right there that our idol needs some help getting back up. And so they lifted him back up. The next day, Dagon is in front of the Ark of the Covenant again. His head's cut off. His hands are cut off. And I love what the way the Bible puts it. It says only the stump was left. Yeah. What happens when you worship a stump of a God? That's what the Philistines did. Even God did this to Jonah. Do you remember in, in, in Jonah chapter number four when there was that gourd that was placed over his temporary dwelling place? And he says, oh, I love that gourd. It's just what I needed, Lord. And the Lord took the gourd and what happened? He got mad at God. He, he, he cared more for the gourd. And this is what God's point to him was, you care more for that gourd than the souls of the people of Nineveh. And what did God have a way of doing? kicking out the leg of the stool and exposing him for who he was. God has a way of doing that. So I would say this tonight as way of application for us. Isn't it better for us to confess our idols before God than for him to have to expose them for their uselessness in our own life? Say, whoa, 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 pastor. <laughs> I mean, we talk about idols of Philistines and even Jonah and the end times, but uh, I go to a Baptist church. I don't have idols. Well, I would dare say that none of us probably have a carved idol in our home that we're bowing down to. But as I've said before, and this is not unique to me, but I've repeated what other pastors have said, an idol is anything that you have to consult before doing the will of God. An idol is anything you have to consult before doing the will of God. Meaning, I know what God wants me to do, but what does my family think? I know what God wants me to do, but what about my pocketbook? I know what God wants me to do, but what about my security? See, we can make idols out of anything, whether it's money or power or recognition or family or security or approval or relationships or food or self. Yes, some of our greatest idols are the ones we see in the mirror every morning that we become the highest authority. It says in First, uh, uh, first Timothy, I believe, if not it's Second Timothy, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God meaning that we love ourselves and love being pleased than more than we love God. What happened? We've turned ourselves into an idol. You know what I would rather do tonight? I would rather confess the idols of my life before God has to say, I need to bring a little bit of calamity in your life to show you how inept your idol actually is. I'll, I'll, I'll give this to you and I'll be done. I used to love playing Jenga with the kids. Anybody played Jenga with their kids before you ever played that? It's, uh, it's nice. Yeah, it's, it's a w great way to have a good family fight. Um, but uh, no, it's a, it's, a, uh, it's, a good, it's a good family game. It's, just, it's this tower that's made with bricks, these little wooden bricks, and you, and you have to kind of cross them back and forth a little bit. And then uh, as you go, one person will, will kind of tap the bricks and find one that's loose, and then you put it on top. And the, and the, the tower gets higher and higher, and obviously as it grows higher, as you're removing the base to make it go higher, it becomes more and more precarious. And eventually, you know what ends up happening? Uh, you end up taking out the wrong piece and the whole thing falls down. What I used to love when the girls were little is they didn't understand what support systems were. And say so they would just try to find a brick near the bottom. And they'd say, oh, I, I think this one's good, Dad. And, and you know, it wasn't even moving. There were others that you could just, you could blow on and the brick would fall out. But they want to grab this one all the way at the bottom, which basically the whole thing rests on. I was like, hey, go ahead, girl, go for it. And you know, before you know it, what happens, the whole thing falls down. Why? Because 
they grabbed the one thing that the entire tower was supported on and everything came down. You know, we have constructed a lot of things in our life that if we're not careful, look very, very close to idols. I mentioned a few of them a few moments ago. And no, you don't bow down, nor do I bow down to idols of gold or silver. None of us pray to icons anymore, to the saints. None of us do those things, but we have created idols in our minds and in our hearts. And we've built up a very precarious tower that God, in his love and compassion, may just walk by and kick down. You know why? Oh, because he just loves chaos. No, because he loves you. You know, with Jenga, nobody really wins. Ever thought about that? I mean, who wins at Jenga? With Jenga, nobody really wins, but somebody always loses. And it's the same with idols. Thank you for listening to this sermon from the pulpit of Liberty Baptist Church. If this message was a blessing to you, or if there's any way we can serve you, please let us know by contacting us at info at mylibertybaptist.org or you can visit us this Sunday at 800 Washington Street in Easton, Massachusetts. May the Lord bless you as you grow in His Word.